Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to SmartLogic's webinar. It's all about semantics, using semantic AI to drive exceptional chatbot experiences. My name is Ann Kelly, and I'll be hosting your webinar today. And with me, I have two awesome speakers, Jeremy Bentley, who's the CEO and founder here at SmartLogic, and Mark Lair, who's the COO at WAN. A few things before we start the broadcast. First of all, this webinar is in broadcast mode, and all of you are muted. If you have questions during the webinar, and we encourage you to have questions, please put them in the GoToWebinar panel that you'll see on the side of right-hand side of your screen. We have about 40 minutes worth of content today, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A session, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And finally, this broadcast is being recorded, and replay information will be sent to everyone who's registered one day following the broadcast. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy. Well, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for attending. Um, thought I'd take us through the agenda. It's uh, hopefully a useful, worthwhile spending of your time. Um, you're going to look at chatbot and all virtual assistant trends. Uh, I've done some research to have a look and bring some uh, interesting facts to light. I think it uh, will show us where we're going. Uh, then move in to talk about chatbots and the customer experience i.e. The, if you like the, the front office, uh, the communication with customers and how we see that uh, developing over time and then take a look at the role that chatbots have with robotic process automation uh, which obviously has been uh, quickly adopted by what we might call the back office operations to help with um, you know process. But before we can really understand why chatbots are being addressed and adopted, uh, it's worth looking at some of the challenges that they have, um, and that would lead to why semantics, and specifically semantic AI, actually helps with the challenges. Um, then we'll look at how the semantic modeling increases the relevant of, uh, relevance of chatbot interactions, and move to how Semaphore and WAND uh, with Mark's help, the one taxonomy's power a chatbot experience. And we have a very simple demonstration, and hopefully by that time you've uh, asked, thought of some good questions to ask, uh, and we will try our best to answer them. So, so the first look at the chat at the trends. I think you know. Let's go and look at a, one of the leading industry analysts in the market. Um, so chatbots are considered to be part of the artificial intelligence world, and they're saying that over the next couple of years, you know, nearly half of organisations are going to start using chatbots for customer care, and 40% will deploy the virtual assistants. I guess that raises a question that you may want to ask. You know, what's the difference between a chatbot and a virtual assistant? Um, really, they are different interfaces in the sense that chatbots typically are text driven up on a screen, you know, driven by questions and answering using the keyboard, whereas virtual assistants are, you know, of the uh, voice to text kind of um, device that you might find in your house. But together, you know, we can argue the, the difference between them, but they're, you know, pretty common. Um, new introductions into the enterprise and a, and a new way of communicating with customers and with employees and with uh, partners. We know that artificial intelligence is restructuring the ways that businesses communicate with both internally, that's the back office, and with customers, the front office. Um, and I think it's, you know, Bart Gardner was saying that it's, it's, it's you're, and, and we're seeing it in our own homes and we're seeing it in our own businesses that chatbots are, are, are going to move from simple user-based queries to advanced real-time conversation to what often is referred to now as uh, conversational commerce. And if we have a quick look at some of the, this is a 2018 uh, chart, but you know, what do you predict you would use a chatbot for, you know, getting a quick answer in an emergency, resolving a complaint or a problem, you know, getting detailed answers or explanations. You know, we're talking about simple but very often asked um, customer uh, requests. Um, 
which may be if you're in uh, the front office, you know, it's a customer talking to you. And if you're in the back office, it might be a staff member ref referring to uh, something on the HR portal or a policy or something like that. And as the chatbots become more advanced, so one would see the use of those chatbots getting more sophisticated. Um, I dug up some quite interesting statistics over the, you know, when putting this web, uh, webinar together. Uh, I actually had not appreciated that there are now over 300,000 chatbots on Facebook. Well, actually, that was last year, or to the end of 2018, um, which, which was surprising. And I don't know why I was surprised, but um, it's evidence that they're rapidly uh, coming into the mainstream, at least for the, uh, the young, you know, if you like, the Facebook generation and starting to use them very commonly. Um, the real industries that are the top industries that are profiting from chatbots is places like which is you'd expect you know real estate, travel, healthcare, finance, education. The fact that 80% of businesses are expected to have some sort of chatbot automation by 2020 is interesting. I suspect that start you know in, in many enterprises it's it's starting off in research, but actually increasingly moving out to uh, satisfy uh, particularly in retail and, and and you know satisfy customer queries at least to Know, put, to show that the business is open uh, 7 by 24 because now that 50% of customers are expecting a business to be open 7 by 24 you, you, you're expecting to get some interaction from your from your supplier uh, all, 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 of all times of the day and night. Um, I think the chatbot market I think that's pretty obvious that it's, it's growing uh, if it was you know three quarters of a billion in 2016 it's, it's growing to 1.3 billion by 2024 and the one reason why I've put the last one in bold, because I think it's the most pertinent, most relevant to those of us who have to implement them uh, or those of us who are looking at them, is that nearly 70% of consumers note that messaging is the most convenient way to stay connected with businesses. So you think about that, that's nearly three quarters of consumers would prefer to have some sort of text slash you know, interface with a business. Um, and that, of course, is what's powering uh, the adoption of this because it's, uh, you know, it's a very, um, you know, it's a rapidly growing and it's also now a very rapidly expected communication mechanism. I think the first trend I wanted to talk about was the front office, let's call it the customer experience. Um, so the research company, you know, if you're a, $823 million, if you've got a $1 billion revenue, annual revenue, you can probably grow that by 823, let's call it um, 250 million a year uh, for three years for a company. If you can uh, increase your customer experience and that generates average revenue increases quite significantly. And I think that the reason for that is, is probably quite obvious, but if you're a customer and you're expecting an instant response, and we know that customers are increasingly needing uh, to be satisfied, you know, response within less than 30 seconds, chatbots are very good for that. Of course, the chatbots, the AI bots, both um, all types, I mean, they, they don't have to go to sleep. They work seven by 24. And that helps with the expectation that consumers and customers have that they expect to get information seven by 24. Okay. And of course, they scale easily. If we've got peak times or we've got, uh, and we need to deliver better customer experience, we can quickly power up some more, uh, you know, put some more on some more processes. So I think it's very clear that based on just customer experience and customer expectation, that you know, businesses will choose over time that the use of chatbots is the way to communicate with their customers, uh, certainly as they become more sophisticated, uh, which is what Gartner is, is expecting. I think the second trend I wanted to talk about is the role of chatbots and robotic process automation. Um, for those of you, I'm sure everyone is familiar with what RPA is, but it's a, it's a very fastly, being fastly adopted technology, which is helping to you know, streamline the internal workflows inside enterprises, really to improve the experience and efficiency of, you know, of, of, of the business. And we see that uh, chatbots uh, very specifically are 
very well centered to our things like human resources, employee um, onboarding, internal help desk type activities. HR is interesting because you can use chatbots to keep a pulse on your employees. But of course, once you've asked a question, quite often that triggers a workflow and that work workflow typically is a, you know, could be handled by an RPA uh, robot. So the combination of chatbots as the interface into, you know, our backup, you know, into our HR or our um, help desk type operations in combination with robotic process automation, you know, as a technology that's going to help, you know, move that process into a transaction. I think it's quite likely that chat, as chatbots become the interface, then RPA and chatbots will integrate. And what's interesting, and of course, to Smart Logic, is that the semantic AI is going to be, we're, we're already integrated with RPA, we're already integrated with chatbots, and actually it's the semantic AI will be required at various points in the workflow to clean the data and effectively handle exceptions. Right? That's, that's where we would position ourselves. So the challenge is having looked at both, if you like, the user experience or customer experience and the internal experience, the challenges, of course, are that human language is very ambiguous and the way we ask things is very ambiguous and uh, our meaning uh, is, you know, conversational and, and, and therefore uh, open to misunderstanding. And if you're a chatbot, you have a hard time with it quite often. So the top three challenges of chatbots and virtual assistants, and if you've used your you know, home systems to try and get it to play the music that you want, is the misunderstanding of requests. You know, the chatbots often mis misinterpret the requests because they're not able to understand the customer's intent. That's about 60% of, uh, of the issues. There's another 60% of 59% to be exact. There's the misunderstanding of the nuance of human dialogue. You know, due to a lack of conversational intelligence, chatbots fail to interpret the nuances of the dialogue, and then that leads to an inaccurate conversation, and then actually that leads to you knowing as a consumer that you're, or, a, or, a, or a member of staff that you're actually talking to a service robot rather than a human, and actually that can make things worse in terms of reputation rather than better. So that's one of the issues. And you know, once one's got, if one doesn't understand the request, or one doesn't understand, or one misunderstands the nuance, you then end up with a chatbot in a, executing inaccurate commands, and of course, doing something that you didn't ask for. The reason why I, I think it's, it's interesting these problems is that the top three issues are solved using knowledge models and semantic AI, which is the reason for, for this webinar and to show you how uh, we go about that. It's interesting also, we've got some voice to text in the demo and you'll see the fourth difficult difficulty is actually understanding accents. Um, so you can tell that I'm, um, that you, when you hear Mark speaking, you'll know that he is American, you can hear that I'm not. And actually with the voice to text, you typically, if we're gonna use the Google voice to text thing, you actually have to choose the accent before you start speaking to it in English. So you'll see that. Now semantics is not involved in that, but it is, it's, you, we're, we're solving the top three issues. So I wanted to look, take a little time on, you know, the, what we refer to as the old way of working, which is the siloed enterprise. And, this is a very simple schematic. It shows, you know, lots of people in an audience doing different tasks, lots of different systems and system applications everywhere from customer and business analytics through business applications and workflow through to websites and portals. And of course, what happens in today's siloed enterprises, there is a, there's a direct peer to peer connection between the system application and its underlying data and meaning and I, you know, in meanings and concepts are actually hardwired into the connections between the two. So if I'm in, I don't know, marketing analytics and I'm looking at my marketing database, I may have a very good definition of the meaning of something to do with my brand and all the things that are associated with it. But if I'm actually in supply, I don't necessarily have access to that meaning because it's, if you like, it is locked up in that point to point connection. And if we actually very specifically go and look at 
the, the right hand side of the screen, the websites and the portals, of course, how do people, customers, how do uh, people using internet get to get access to uh, information? Well, there's a index cycle where the enterprise search engine indexes the content in multiple different systems. And what if we look very specifically what that index cycle is, we're basically and essentially organizing text strings. And we're counting and creating, if you like, a, a, an organization or a database of all the different words, but according to binary, you know, binary strings. So my name is Jeremy. If I go looking for Jeremy on my search engine, it'll go looking for everywhere, every word where, which contains the string J-E-R-E-M-Y. And then if we look at the other side, which is how do we access that information, the query cycle, your user requests, again, a set of strings. So if I were to go looking for my name, you would, I would key in the string J-E-R-E-M-Y and the search engine will say, oh, that's good. I will go and get that off the index and I will surface you the answers. And that's quite a, it's a batch and brittle process. It has no concept of what, what you'll see later, which is concepts or things, um, because um, things are not strings, they are ideas, they are concepts, they involve relationships. And that's where the semantic AI comes into play. To give you an example of a typical enterprise search before in the old siloed way, let's talk, go through an example. You know, I'm a consumer, I'm going to a travel site, uh, I put in what I'm looking for. In this case, we've all been trained now to only have two words as a you know, viable question, holiday Spain what happens, the search engine goes off and surfaces all content containing the text strings of holiday and Spain, uh, which is, a, you know, if, you, if this is in the physical, virtual world, but in the physical world, if you went into a travel agent and asked for holiday Spain, you would, of course, get all the brochures to do with, with mentioning the word holiday and mentioning Spain landing at your feet. So you end up with far too many results. And of course, not in any particular order, because that's all it's done. It's done a string based uh, uh, retrieval. But what we also haven't got, so we might get too many results of one kind, but we're going to miss out on missing results because we're not going to get vacation in Spain because that string doesn't, is not, it says holiday, not vacation. So the concept of a holiday or the concept of a vacation is what is needed if you're going to try and get, you know, a full complement of results. And equally, we're not going to get, and we're going to be missing related concepts. You know, the idea of a weekend break in Barcelona is never going to come from out of a search engine that goes when you're asking it to do a holiday in Spain, unless you're very lucky uh, and it's somehow, you know, but, but it's not a guaranteed result. So uh, hopefully that shows you why we need to improve um, and move from strings to things. And we do that using semantic AI. And it's as relevant for chatbots as it is for RPA as it is for many other applications inside the enterprise. And today, most search based applications are string based. You know, metadata is siloed and string based. Uh, and we'll come back to that theme uh, over and over again because that's what we're trying to uh, basically change. In terms of the new way of working, we've seen how we've got point to point, you know, implicit meaning in between different business applications unavailable to all. What Semaphore's job is to do is to add a layer, a semantic AI layer or a platform where the meanings, the concepts and the relationships for the whole enterprise are in one addressable enterprise resource. So you can address your enterprise data and metadata you know, all the systems applications can have one place to go for the meanings, concepts and relationships uh, to get the context. Um, I think it's also interesting and highlighted in red are the new types of application that have come into the enterprise over the last few years. You know, chatbots, essentially an extension of the user experience, customer experience alongside websites and portals and now chatbots. Um, we could position them very much just as, a, you know, as an extension to that. I would point out, you know, that the robotic process automation is now sitting nicely alongside, you know, the existing business applications and it's trying to you know, help some of those processes go end to end. And we see the increase in, uh, you know, the introduction of machine learning analytics, you know, cognitive computing alongside customer and business analytics. Um, in the information services space, we've got, you know, new, new 
read voice to text and text to voice helping with the conversation aspects of you know customer support um so these are new technologies and i would before i would point out that semaphore is none of these we're not a chatbot we're not an rpa we're not a machine learning an analytics system and we're not voice to text all these systems require access to the meanings, concepts, and relationships that are available in order to become conversational, in order to be able to be contextual. Right? And the technology that we're using to do that, uh, if you're interested, is you know, the concept of a knowledge graph. So if we start to relook at the way the semantic search works with uh, chatbots, with the semantic AI system, we see that the index cycle between, you know, whether it's a chatbot or a portal or a website, the index cycle is now a metadata index and it's talking about things, so concepts, and we'll have you an example of that uh, in a little while. The query cycle can again be a conversation about things and it's directly with the audience and the introduction into the enterprise architecture of the, of the semantic AI platform is that mean it, is that the meanings, the concepts, and the relationships are available to all the different applications, including chatbots and RPA and machine learning analytics and voice to text, you'll see that in a minute, um, through a metadata hub, you know, slash a knowledge graph. So it's removing that siloed approach in the enterprise to give, you know, in this case, the chatbots have a place to go for the concepts so that we can give a conversational we can have a conversation with the end user or with the internal person who's coming after you know information on a policy to do with hr something for example so taking the stage two which is you know how do semantic search and chatbots actually work and this is you'll see this is a schematic of the of the mecha mechanics of it you'll see how we can introduce conversation and how we can make the chatbots be more uh, contextual so that it's being relevant about the subject of interest being questioned by the user. So we take the same search, the holiday Spain, and the first thing, rather than just go and look for the strings, the first thing that we, that's, we're going to do is we're going to look up the meaning of holiday and we're going to look up the meaning of Spain. In this schematic, if it's blue, it's a human, and if it's black, it's the, it's the software, it's the AI software. So we look up in our knowledge model, the meaning of holiday and the meaning of Spain, and uh, the, 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 the semantic AI says, oh, well, actually, holiday is an activity, but it's also, uh, but you should use the word vacation, because that's, that, that's, that's a better word for it. And Spain is of a concept type country, and actually it's known as Spain, which allows the computer or the chatbot to ask, did you mean you're looking for a vacation in Spain? So that is a confirmation of, we've understood the subject that the human is interested in, and then the chatbot can give back a contextual answer. So the user says yes, tick, and then we go back into a, the second part of the conversation. Now we, we've got confirmation that we're on the right track. We can say, oh, let's go and look up the concept of Spain. Rather than the meaning, we've got that. But let's, we know we've been told there's a concept. Let's look that up. And we can see that Spain is a, is a country type. And the type that it is, is the, the concept of a large, varied country. It's got a capital city in Madrid. It's got popular activities. You know, beach vacations. There's also because this is our model of Spain, and we're in the business of selling holidays. We also have a sponsored promotion called a long weekend at the location in Ibiza. So the chatbot is being given all the search engine, all the um, you know, it's being given a contextual pointer to help with conversational commerce. And the, the computer, the chatbot can ask, well, Spain is a large, varied country and offers many types of vacations. Shall I offer you some ideas? So the user says, oh, that's clever. Uh, that's very intuitive. Uh, and then so we can set the bot to work against all the different systems that it's connected to. And it will go, well, would you like to visit the capital city, Madrid? Would you like to search for beach vacations or experience a long weekend in Ibiza? So because human beings are not 
a synchronous, we will probably give a you know diff a, diff a difficult answer. What's meant to be a one, one, two, or three comes back as one, you know, <laughs> as an ambiguous answer. Well, I actually I'm interested in a weekend in Ibiza and the beach. Notice that we're dealing in text speak. We're not even dealing in full sentences here. It's quite interesting that the chatbot can be actually more grammatically correct, more formal if you want it to be than the actual text speak that we're getting back from our human users. Um, but having got elicited, it's a weekend in Ibiza and the beach, we can go back to the knowledge model. We can look up the concept of a long weekend. We can look up the location of Ibiza. We can filter the idea of Ibiza. And we can filter on sponsored promotions, whatever it is that the business rules demand and decide the chatbot. We can check and why would we want to look up the concept of a long weekend? Because we need to know that it's a check-in on a Friday and check-out on a Monday. Why do we want to know what's special about Ibiza and that's sponsored? Well, because we've got to be able to be contextually uh, um, sound when we're going back with good with good answers we know that ibiza is a location its activity is both nightclubs and beach vacations so that the chatbot can further go on to say that we offer two types of long weekend are you interested in mainly nightclubbing or mainly the beach or mainly beach and of course the user carries on well beach and that's the end of that illustration but you'll see, hopefully that's been a good sort of peeling away of how knowledge models are helping get contextual reasoning through from the chatbot to be able to give a contextual customer experience. And of course it matters, the knowledge model is the thing that changes. So if you're in giving your uh, employees or you know in access to frequently asked questions inside you know on the HR chatbot you know you, the model is going to be talking about health policies and I don't know notice periods and whatever those concepts are that are relevant to your HR department but the chatbot has access to those meanings and just the same way as in this example uh, the, the semantic model is uh, the knowledge model is all about uh, the holiday in Spain and the ideas behind that. So now, if that was useful, I'll pass over to Mark and he'll take us through Knowledge Models 101. Thanks, Jeremy. That was, that was great content. And, and I think we wanted to come back now that we've talked about the challenges of chatbots and, and the promise of chatbots and kind of the experience you want to be able to deliver with chatbots. It's important to come back to talk about well, what is a knowledge model and how does that work? And also, I think more importantly, how do you how do you talk about that in the organization? I think based on Jeremy's content and the statistics we looked at earlier, there's 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 a lot of promise for chatbots and people are delivering chatbots and people hear AI and those concepts. And I think people in an organization can get really excited about that. Yeah, let's do a chatbot, let's do AI. Um, but how does that actually work? The, the, concept of a chatbot is really sexy, but then we have to get into, well, how do we provide a conversational experience like what, what Jeremy demonstrated? And, and I'll, I'll provide another example in a moment. And that comes down to the knowledge model. And I've been in the taxonomy and the ontology business for 16, 17 years, and not quite as long as Jeremy, but we both have a lot of experience. And what, what we have found and what we know is that it's important to be able to simplify these concepts and explain them to the business users in a meaningful way. So as far as chatbots and AI, I like to kind of use an analogy. And imagine we're having a conversation internally, do, you know, we're having, we, we want to be able to be open 24 seven, or seven by 24, as Jeremy would say, and answer customers' queries efficiently and be able to scale up during peak time. So we want all those advantages of a chatbot. Um, now, why do we have to build a knowledge model? The, the an example I would use is pretend we're bringing on 10 new customer service reps or somebody who's going to interact with the customer whose job it is to answer questions for employees or for somebody. Now, we, what we wouldn't do is bring those 10 people on and immediately put them behind the keyboard or put them behind the customer service desk and expect them to answer questions. If I go into a bank and they've hired a teller and they just put them right behind the, um, the desk, and I go in and say, I'd like to open a HELOC. That person's gonna look back at me with a blank stare if they haven't been taught 
that a HELOC stands for Home Equity Line of Credit. And a Home Equity Line of Credit is a type of, of mortgage loan, a type of loan. And that that product, the product that the bank sells, needs to go through an underwriting process and there's forms associated to it. Instead, that person might tell me, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Just with our home system, sometimes we ask it questions and it says, I'm not sure. So the reason for that is because what you would actually do with human beings is you would hire them and then you would put them through a process of teaching them what are the important concepts to our business? What are the things that people might be asking you about? What do these things or what do these concepts mean in context of the business? So just as, as you would take time to uh, teach or provide knowledge to human beings so that they can appropriately answer questions, you need to do the very same thing for your chatbot or for an AI. And that's where a knowledge model comes in. So I think that's a really important conversation to have with the business. It's not just buying the, the chatbot software, or the, or the AI tool, it's giving it the appropriate knowledge. And that's why we're building a knowledge model. So from there, what actually is a knowledge model? And the first primary thing that it does is it enumerates the important concepts or as, as Jeremy called them, the things that we might be interested in. And, I, you know, the more narrow the, the focus, I think the better you can deliver greater results. Just if it's a broader focus, you're going to have a broader universe of things that are within the model. The second thing the knowledge model is going to do, which is very important, is identifying the context of concepts and relationships between the concepts. So it's not useful. It, it, it's not 100% useful for the idea of a visa to be in a knowledge model if we haven't said that that's a city in Spain or that it's a holiday vacation um, spot or that activities associated to it are beach and night clubbing. <clears throat> so we need to identify the concepts and then begin to define the relationships between those concepts. And then the third you know, primary function of the knowledge model is reflecting different ways of expressing those concepts. So you know, one of the top challenges of chatbots was, to, as Jeremy noted earlier, was to understand different ways of expressing things. And human beings, when we chat and we talk, um, we use jargon, acronyms, synonyms, different ways of reflecting things. And, and that needs to be in the knowledge model. So the example that I had earlier of the HELOC as a home equity line of credit, that's two different ways that a customer may come in and ask um, for that product. And that, those both need to be reflected in the knowledge model so that if some, if, any, if people use any of those variants or ways of reflecting that concept, you can then, you know, the, the chatbot can understand that concept, recognize that concept, and then go through the process of, of providing conversational responses back. Um, that's what the knowledge model is. And the purpose of the knowledge model, I think Jeremy has actually covered that very well, but it's providing that common language for an organization or for a topic, the agreed upon concepts that we want to be able to provide answers for. And, and from there, providing understanding of and context to that unstructured content. And I think it's really important, this last this piece, um, and, and why we were excited about this webinar is, you know, as Jeremy said, Semaphore is not a chatbot. It's not AI. Those, the data that Juan provides in our taxonomies are not chatbots or AI either, but they're critical enabling ingredients of AI. I think even the phrase AI, or if it's in our knowledge model, we need to reflect it as artificial intelligence as well. Sometimes people imagine that there's true artificial intelligence underneath, but really what's enabling those types of experiences is a knowledge model. So the way that, that uh, Smart Logic and Wand can work together, the, you know, sort of a prescribed way that you can create a knowledge model for your organization, there's just you know, three easy steps. And the first is from the Wand perspective and the taxonomy of the knowledge model perspective. Is, is we think it's a great approach if you can seed that knowledge model. Um, 
want foundation taxonomies or a rich set of predefined concepts. We have knowledge models for industry verticals and business functional areas, and it can be a great place to start. But if you don't work, if we don't have a taxonomy that's a fit, or you have a vocabulary or knowledge model in your organization that that is better, or that that is a fit, start with that. I think it can transform a project from a um, from a build a knowledge model, which might be overwhelming, into one where you're beginning to just edit and customize. So that's one. If you can get something to start with, that's going to be a big leap forward. Second step is you want to begin to customize that knowledge model to make it specific for the types of questions that you want your chatbot to be able to answer. Um, that's defining the relationship between the entities in the knowledge model. That's creating the different synonyms or different ways that that concept might be reflected. Um, and from the smart logic perspective, you know, WAND brings some predefined knowledge models. And Semaphore is a best-in-class knowledge model editing software package. So that's kind of one of the goals of putting this webinar together today and why Wand and Semaphore or Wand and Smart Logic have partnered. What I think if, if I can link one and two together and, and talk about if you start with a seed knowledge model, you can really um, get moving quickly. And the reason for that is with a semaphore and with a knowledge model, you can begin to kind of start asking questions on a test basis right away and, and see what answers the chatbot might be bringing back. And that's, that's gonna help you identify the types of relationships or new concepts that you may want to add to the knowledge model before you're ready to um, kick it off again versus just starting with nothing, a bit of a, a longer putt. Third piece, at some point, you're going to decide we've got a model. We're ready to publish our chatbot. Don't think that you're done with the knowledge model. Iterative improvement is a really important piece to make sure that you're continuing to answer questions correctly. So we're, we strongly believe in putting governance into place to refine that model based on content, based on user queries. Um, just as if you were to go back to the example earlier, if you had a team of 10 customer service reps, at the end of the week, you might sit down on Friday and have a team meeting and say, hey guys, what what questions did you get this week that we didn't, that you weren't able to answer? Was there anything new that we need to do training on? That's the same idea for iterative improvement of the knowledge model that the chatbots can draw from and, and answer the questions. So one last slide from my, my side, we'll just kind of talk about an, another example um, this one a little bit more IT related, how a semantic model might improve the chatbot interactions. And on the left, you're going to see a slice from the WAND information technology taxonomy. And on the right, we have a query. Somebody might ask a chatbot or virtual assistant and saying, I'm getting a BSOD when launching IE9. So this is an example where some acronyms or some jargon are used. What you'll see in the knowledge model is that BSOD is actually a synonym for a blue screen of death. The synonyms reflected by the, the bidirectional arrow. And you can see that blue screen of death is under the category of error type. So right now, right away, the, the chatbot or the knowledge model can tell that we're getting an error type and it's a blue screen of death. And then when we have IE9, well, we see that that's also a synonym for Internet Explorer 9, which is a version of Internet Explorer, which is a web browser. And so now we've taken those two uh, concepts or things and identified what they actually are, the, the official, the preferred way of reflecting that concept, and we've put some context around each of those con concepts. So that's going to help with this query, but when we, if, if we can then take the next step of that step number three in the iterative development of the model, if a new version of Internet Explorer comes out, we want to be able to create that concept and place it in the knowledge model. We want to reflect that IE10 might be a way to speak that to refer to Internet Explorer. And but it doesn't stop with versions. Maybe Microsoft Edge, that's an, a new product entirely that needs to be added to the model. And if we look at the query, one thing that the the model doesn't reflect well now is is the task when launching. So what does launching mean? So that's something that could be added to the model as well the tasks that might be causing the error, the tasks that might be associated with the uh, software. 
we could add launching and then think of other ways that someone might be talking about launching, uh, starting IE9, opening IE9, maybe double clicking on IE9. So using a tool like Semaphore, you can create the concepts and add those relationships. And again, that's providing more information to the knowledge model, to the chatbot, so that it's continuing to respond to user queries. Thank you very much, Mark. And hopefully that's... Yeah, Jeremy, I think you're going to... All right, go ahead, Jeremy. So that shows how, and of course, by changing the knowledge model, you get an instantaneous change in your in your customer experience. It's much easier to go into the knowledge model, and add and updates, and then the the, the 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 chatbot or the search engine is going to perform according to the new concepts and language that are there. And those concepts of language are being put in by business users, uh, which is a very important step in making it easy to use. So I was going to show you a um, quick demonstration of very similar to that um, to that uh, query. This is a very quick view into uh, Sem4. Um, I'm going to turn on the Google's voice to speech. Uh, in order to do that, you'll notice that the fourth biggest problem was not understanding dialects. So I need to set Google speech, text to speech to United Kingdom. Um, but if I then go blue BSOD launching strata. The knowledge model has come back and said, you're talking about this product, you're talking about this uh, search toolkit, guest operating system, you're talking about the, the, the task of starting, and you're talking about the symptom of blue screen death. And so it, that's a sort of peek into how the chatbot with the voice will get its true meaning from the semantic AI and from the knowledge model, so that then it can now take that as the high quality, trustworthy data to then drive that chatbot conversation down these uh, these topics, which we've now divined out of the voice. Equally, it doesn't have to be voice. We can just go, can't access. App speed after upgrade. And we get similar type of no harmonizing of the human language into the tasks, the different types of how they're upgrading, there's a task of accessing, and the product has been defined uh, out of the taxonomy. So that brings us to the end of our 45 minutes of uh, webinar, leaving us some time for some questions. It does indeed. Thank you, Jeremy and Mark, for sharing your time and your expertise with us. I have a couple questions and I'm just going to go through. I've gotten more than once for the group. Yes, um, you will receive the playback. Um, the playback should go out one day following, so tomorrow, Friday. Um, and then I've had a couple questions where people want to know more about Smart Logic as a product, and um, we will have someone reach out to you and, and talk about the offerings. Um, so my first question here is for Mark. Um, you talk a lot about knowledge models, but on one screen you had a little, on the over on the right it said taxonomy and ontology. Are knowledge models the same as a taxonomy and an ontology or are they different? That, that is a great question and the, and the purpose of that slide was I think when we're speaking to the business, you don't need to get into the jargon of a taxonomy or a model or a, or a taxonomy or an ontology or a thesaurus. I, I think it's better to simplify it as a knowledge model. Uh, uh, but to answer the question, a taxonomy is a type of model, an un a knowledge model, and an, an ontology is a type of knowledge model, a glossary is a type of knowledge model, and, and they're going to be used 
for different things. Taxonomies are really good. They're more of a tree structure. I think they're really powerful for browse interfaces like on an e-commerce e website to, to navigate through the categories. When we're talking about chatbots and AIs, and AI, that knowledge model really is going to be an ontology. So if you think of a taxonomy as a tree structure, an, an ontology with broader term and narrower term, an ontology is really more of a web, meaning you can define concepts and create any types of relationships between them and multiple relationships between multiple different concepts, you're not as constrained. And, and really a knowledge model for question answering, which is what a chatbot is, needs to be an ontology. But I still encourage people to avoid using that jargon. I think particularly when you're speaking to business users and, and maybe trying to make the business case internally and, and sell the value, sometimes words like ontology and taxonomy end up being more confusing. I like to simplify it to just knowledge model. Thanks, Mark. This one's going to go to Jeremy because I think it's directed at the product. Does does the model only work with the English language or does Semaphore have the capability to understand multiple languages? Um, the answer is multiple languages. We, we cover uh, most of the world's most common languages, uh, certainly, uh, you know, all the European languages, including English, but also Chinese, Japanese and Korean, you know, Arabic, uh, Thai, you know, most of the, we've, we've got most of them. There are, there are a few that are not there. I think um, Sami might not be one of our languages, but no, it's 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 very rich. The whole, you know, the computer doesn't really on it doesn't really care what the language is. What you, what we have to do is we which we which we we have is you have to understand the structure of the grammar of the language so that you can then uh, and, and of course uh, Chinese grammar is very different from English grammar or from German grammar. But once you understand the the, the true grammatical constructs. Uh, and we use a lot of machine learning for that to do our natural language processing. Once you understand that, you can then go and take any text string in any language and, and start to do what we showed you today in English. And the models can be in multiple languages. So if you're a, you know, you've got teams in, um, I don't know, in Tokyo and they're writing and they're doing text in Japanese, but actually you've also got a support center in, um, you know, that process it, but that deals in in English, you know, you can have multiple models, one model with multiple different languages associated with it. Great, thank you. Mark, did, was there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I, I think I will add, I think that's the power of the knowledge model approach, actually, is the ability to have a single model that with translation for the concepts in other languages. Uh, translation it, it, it in, in another language is very much just another, it's a synonym in, 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 some, in many ways. Um, so I think actually the knowledge model approach is more scalable across different languages rather than training sets or something where you need to build a, a you know, find a bunch of documents and content in each of the languages to try to teach. You know, the knowledge model approach doesn't require that. Okay. Um, here's an interesting one. Is it possible to feed utterances from a chatbot, in other words, speech to text, and feed them into Semaphore to discover or see concepts that are not in the knowledge, currently not in the knowledge graph? Yes, as a um, we have we've put a lot of uh, I'll answer the question in two ways. The first thing that we care deeply about is data quality. So we we do insist with our semantic AI engine that there's a governance process that, that if you like, moves a concept into a live situation into live model. So that it's you know a human being has looked at that and decided that that's an appropriate concept and it's related to those other appropriate concepts. So you can think of that as the governance function that Mark was referring to earlier. But that doesn't mean, and, and this is what we do do, is we've got a lot of AI technology that look, at, for example, can examine search logs or chat lot the chatbot logs or you know and see 
the results of questions that didn't get a good answer or where people have dropped off quickly and because they didn't get satisfaction. So that machine learning side of semantics is all something that Sound4 has in it. What we do though is we, we're, we're strong on saying, we'll give you a candidate concept with its candidate relationships. And all we need is a human who understands the subject matter to make it live, to put it into action. So that's hopefully the best of both worlds. You're not, you're, you're just keeping your contextual realism grounded in what you mean, because every business has a different concept of meaning about different subjects. And it's, we see it as an editor, editorial governance. But the, there's a lot of software that goes towards finding those connections for you, for you to validate. And that's from Juan's perspective, that's something we really like about a tool like Semaphore is that it it makes it so easy and I think quicker to, to customize um, a taxonomy on an ongoing basis or an initial seed taxonomy. So you're not bogged down in, um, again, and kind of starting from scratch or doing research. It's, it's giving you suggestions and a, a human being can make those decisions. They're really powerful. So I've gotten this question a couple of times and we've talked about it a little bit, but maybe we, but we didn't really give it a good definition. So what really is a knowledge graph? A knowledge graph is a specific form of model which is using post-relational database technology, right? And what, what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, it's, there's a new type of database called graph databases, which are changing the way people are looking at data because you don't have to presuppose the question. So a knowledge graph is, if you like, a database of your knowledge stored in a graph where you can easily access your concepts um, without having to second guess what concepts you're going to need up front. And if you're not familiar with graph, I mean, graph came out of the Google, I think, invented it because they've got this massive search engine index and they needed to, you know, as you're getting information, you need to populate it, but you can't, but you, you are not bound by the schema. And it's now become a very, you know, it's now some, often referred to as a graph database, but sometimes it's referred to as a, you know, post-relational. It's, it's an important technology because you don't, because you're no longer bound by the schema. And if you're not bound by the schema, you can put your knowledge in there and access it in many different ways, which is, of course, what you need when you're having many applications of different types access that knowledge, those concepts. And now to kind of just follow on that, just a tad, we also have talked about Metadata Hub. And, and is there a difference between a knowledge graph and a metadata hub? Um, I think it's a sort of it's it there's there there isn't i mean a metadata hub can be a knowledge graph but a knowledge but not all metadata not hubs are knowledge graphs there's, so the knowledge graph is referring really to the the type of the type of data architecture that the knowledge is stored in but equally a metadata hub can be you know connected into a uh, an elastic you know into a search engine index or it could be using a, a traditional sql database so one is a subset of the other okay um, and this one might be for Mark, maybe for actually for both of you. Um, is the process of building and that iterative process of building a knowledge model manual, or are there AI tools or other tools that can that can help that? I think that speaks to what we spoke the the previous question of are there capabilities in in Semaphore to suggest terms. Um, I think it. it I, I do think it's worthwhile and a good idea to have the governance in place and probably have a human being make the final call on does something belong in the model and where it belongs in the model and kind of what that right relationship is. But certainly if you can have um, leverage NLP or, or other technologies like what's built into Semaphore to be looking through the queries and looking through the data for you and making suggestions that's that's what really accelerates the process but i you know, i don't think you'd want to remove the human judgment from it entirely 
is my feeling, but the more you can leverage um, technology to to provide you with suggestions, the better. Jeremy, you have any other thoughts on that? Um, in this series of webinars, I've we've already done one on you know, the role of metadata and metadata hubs and knowledge models in with um, machine learning, and there are, it, it, it's quite important because I know that you know the concept of machine learning is 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 you know is an excellent one, but all learners, human or machine, they need professors or teachers to give them context. And if you're in the AI world, you get your context from two places. You can either get your, or probably both, depending on your business application. But the machine learning algorithms need context, which they get either in the form of training sets or in the form of metadata. I mean, the semaphore approach is to reprocess and extract metadata out of text so that you're not having to deal with training sets, which are very difficult to put together and very difficult to, to control for bias. So we, that's why we want human governance in that step, because we can use our machine learning stuff to come out with ideas, but really it's got to be signed off by a human, uh, because you need a professor to to, to mark the papers, you know, to mark the thesis, to know about the subject, to say that's correct, that's not right. Um, and it's no different if you're a machine learning or if you're a human learner, you still got to have some governance, to say what's right and what's wrong. I think there was a famous story from a, one of the major technology companies released a, a conversational chatbot, just, just kind of social media or, or somewhere, and, and it was all, automated and they wanted it to learn from the conversations and um it it went off the rails quite quickly and and the conversations are turned in the wrong direction that they didn't expect based on just it wasn't governed and it was i think learning profanity and uh, other things but, but there's risks and that the, the human governance is important and particularly if one's dealing with um I don't know, let's say you put a chatbot in front of your HR policies, right? You want to be sure that the, the, the answers are actually coming out of the right policy, not all that the poli all that the, the, the model of the policies is actually accurately representing what the business wants to represent. Uh, and it's going to be an HR expert who can look at that mod knowledge model and say, yep, that's right. Um, and you're not going to let a machine do all the analysis without checking before you make it live because otherwise you, you put yourself at risk of giving out the wrong information to an employee which may end in you know may end badly for everybody and, the, and also the, to kind of call back to my you know, the analogy earlier you you wouldn't release a customer service rep and just leave them and check in in a year and let them make up answers in the meantime there's there's a continuous teaching process so we have one more minute and I have one more question a little looking to the future. Today chatbots are used for customer experience and those simple user interaction. What do, what do both of you see as the future of chatbots? What new use cases can they solve or be applied to? I'll take it first if you like. Um, sure. yeah. And I think in the same way that, you know, what a, what is what a, what a computer technology been doing for the last 50 years it's incrementally been improving efficiencies of actually the simplest tasks um so you might you know so we've had workflow applications which have been moving data and documents around the organizations which has become more of a robotic process automation but we're still you know we're we're, we're addressing the simple the most simple that we can that moves the efficiency on or moves the advantage on. We're not taking on the, the hardest tasks, and that's going to continue. As the, as the semantics and the understanding of, of, of human language gets more and more richer and richer, so we're going to take on more complex tasks. We're going to have richer conversations without humans having to get involved until it gets to a point where it, you know, it can't. And I, 
and so I see an incremental increase in efficiency by the introduction of chatbots that will remove um, you know quite a lot of complex tasks sorry simple tasks there was a statistic that I, I heard the other day which was that when bank automatic automatic teller machines were introduced into the world um, everyone expected well, here's the question for everybody is how many bank tellers do you think do you think there are more or less bank tellers in the world now we've got atms in place uh, than before the atm so i now realize it's a read-only webinar so i'll give you the answer there are actually twice more, as many bank, <laughs> there are many more bank tellers in the world per head of you know per population than there were before and the reason is that ATMs took over the basic task of counting money and, and taking in checks and all that stuff and that freed up the uh, the human tellers and it gave to become more sales oriented more support oriented more customer centric and then they found that because their business grew they needed more sales people who are being bank tellers who would provide rich, richer services and I think that's what chatbots are going to help with we, we can see the you know good automation of the simple tasks that get asked you know a hundred times a day into HR or a hundred times you know a thousand times a day into one's commerce portal and that will free us up to think of more and creative things and get on with the more complex tasks and that's how I think it'll go. Mark, uh, can you give us in a few short words what you think? I I, I agree with that with, with Jeremy that entirely i think it's the the lower judgment task the repetitive task i you know I, I don't know what the specific area um might be but i think there's, there's certainly a buzzword around and, and for companies around employee engagement and, and having people excited about what they do and i think those types of jobs where you are answering the same question a hundred times each day tend to have higher turnover and and are actually really well suited to put chatbots into place. Um, so I, I, I think Jeremy hit the nail on the head. Okay, well, we're out of time. Um, again, thank you, Mark and Jeremy, for your time and, and sharing your expertise with us. And thank you to all of you who attended our webinar today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you.